Kevin Gigu. Hey, thank you, thank you. Love you. Thank you. Great to be with you. God bless. Oh, a morning in the Word together. Wow. It's so wonderful in our lives just to stop and pray, just to stop and read the scriptures, just to stop what we're doing and share the word with a little electrician boy that was at my house three days ago talking about finding a wife and about how God helps you do that. And uh, sometimes in the West, in America, we are in such a big hurry to do everything that we worship at the altar of multitasking sometime, uh, whatever that means, depending on which article you read as to whether that's a good thing or not. Uh, but our prayer life, there should be a time where we just stop everything and pray, where we just stop everything else and read the scriptures, where we just stop everything else and share uh, the, the faith that we have with somebody else where we stop our schedule and we get to where believers are and we gather with them, where we stop everything else and we uh, overflow of the gifts that we have to other people. Uh, let's not be in such a hurry that we don't, uh, that we think we have to be doing 10 secular things while we're doing one little spiritual thing. It's okay. You're not wasting your time when you're doing nothing but praying. You're not wasting your time when you're doing nothing but reading from the Bible. <laughs> That's my prefatory interlude for the morning here. I'm thankful for the opportunity to, to be together. I never take it for granted. I know Tom feels this way too. We're up here a lot, and I know you hear our voices a lot, and you see our face, and you hear our little joke, and you know what we're going to say and how we're going to say it a lot of times. But I suspect... Jesus had his favorite joke, and <laughs> Peter and John and James, but we love each other all the way through this wonderful life. We escort each other through this life in this church, and I am so honored to be a part of your spiritual growth and to watch you become more like Jesus every day. Um, Sarah and I were just at the Yeoman's Fellowship on Thursday night, and... Um, Craig and I were at the Columbus Fellowship a, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the folks on live stream, uh, they are just trying to do there what we're trying to do here. And it's just a holy, sacred thing to be a part of a faith family, a faith community, uh, to grow like we grow. Sometimes we think of the story of the Bible as a history of famous people. Uh, when you think, well, I, I need to do, teach the Kingdom Kids group, you think, well, let's see, do I talk about uh, Adam and Eve? Do I talk about uh, Noah and Mrs. Noah? Do I talk about uh, Abraham and Sarah? Do I, you know, talk about uh, Moses or David or Jesus or, you know, a dozen names come to your mind the first time. But the, the story of the Bible is much bigger than a dozen famous names of highlighted people. In fact, in a sense, it's even more about the millions of God's people since creation who have endeavored to walk faithfully. And I'm here this morning just to congratulate you on your faithfulness to walk with Him whether you're an unsung hero or a sung hero, whether you're recognized or not recognized, uh, it's recognized in the kingdom. We are unsung heroes in this world and in culture and society most of the time. But we are uh, praised, we are famous people in the kingdom of God. Among the angelic host, uh, that can be, man, He's always sharing the light with people. You know, you're, you're a movie star among the angels, in a sense, because of your faithfulness to him. 
faith, we talk a lot about faith. Well, a lot of faith in Scripture is faithfulness. Uh, most scholars believe that the, the uh, nine fruit of the Spirit, when you come to the, the word pistis, pistuo, that it should be translated faithfulness. Because as you walk by the Spirit, the result, fruit is a result. That's why it uses the word fruit. It comes from something, right? Faith is faithfulness. Faithfulness comes from walking by the Spirit. You'll find yourself more faithful. And the, the faithful people across Scripture are not just the famous faithful people, but the not-so-famous ones, the people whose names aren't mentioned at all, or are mentioned maybe once, or just a, a couple of times. And I would encourage you, as you read God's Word in your life, uh, to look for the unsung heroes, the, the not-so-famous people, too. Because most believers are going to be not so famous their entire life, and you may not have your scribbled picture in the margin of the dictionary, unless you're Hitler or, you know, somebody else that did something good or super good or super bad, you know. But we're the faithful, every faithful member is an unsung hero, and instead of putting a picture of David and uh, Jonathan or whoever in the background, I put you in the background. You are, to this world, you're unsung heroes. You don't get a lot of attention. But my goodness, you are stage stars uh, alongside the Lord Jesus. He's the star of the show, that's for sure. He's the big hero in our life. But I want to talk a little bit about heroes and a lot about uh, the unsung heroes today. Casey, can we go to that first one? Thomas Clarkson played a crucial role in the abolition of British slavery. I don't know that you know Thomas Clarkson, do you? You've heard of William Wilberforce. Wilberforce, uh, in the late 1700s, pushed to abolish slavery in Great Britain. Wilberforce, they named colleges after him and cities after him. Ohio has a city name. But Thomas Clarkson was promoting the abolition of slavery in Great Britain before William Wilberforce, and a lot of what this guy did set the stage for Wilberforce then to, uh, to be a prime minister, not a prime minister, but to, in government to push a law that finally in 1807 they, they abolished slavery in Great Britain. And a lot of it is because of this unsung hero. There's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes, and I want you to be inspired by the things that you do behind the scenes that you don't think makes a big deal. But the entire Bible is a story of redemption. It's a story of redemption, of God redeeming mankind. It's God fixing everything. It's God making everything right. And you and I are a part of the redemption arc the redemption story, the restoration of Eden and creation into the new heaven and the new earth. You're a part of that. How, how exciting that is to be a part of a huge big picture. See, these, these are characters. The next one then, Alan Turing. You may not know Alan Turing, but he's the guy that cracked Germany's Enigma Code and it helped bring World War II to an end much more quickly. So, thousands of thousands of lives. And if you hadn't seen a movie about his life, you might not have ever heard of it. <laughs> you know, the movie people figure they've made every movie about everything, so they're digging a little bit deeper in the well. They're finding some of the unsung heroes. And uh, so that's what this guy did. He didn't get a lot of attention. Uh, some people consider that the beginning of the computer age because he used a lot of his mathematics and they used technology to figure out how to break this code that the Germans used to communicate with each other. The next one, please. Tenzing Norgay, vital part of the team to conquer Everest, the tallest sur uh, summit. Everybody's heard of Sir Edmund Hillary. We call him Sir Edmund Hillary because when he got back from climbing the mountain, the queen had made him a knight. She had knighted him. She even knighted the other British guy who helped them get up toward the peak. He didn't even get to the peak, and he was knighted. Mr. Norgay uh, got some recognition, got a, a, a plaque or something that was carved. He got a little bit of recognition, and on, he got an honorary medal, but he certainly wasn't knighted. 
and he was the second guy to get to the, the summit. In fact, history wasn't sure if he made it first or Hillary did, but at the end of his life he wrote a book and said, Hillary made it first. So, and then this last one of these examples, Rick Rescorla, some of you may have read about Mr. Rescorla, security director for Morgan Stanley during 9-11 in New York City. He helped uh, approximately 2,700 people escape. Morgan Stanley had about 2,700 employees and all but 13 made it out because of of this man. But you probably haven't heard of Rick Rescorla. There's a lot of things that you have done in your past that you've forgotten about that have changed lives. And you you need to stop. Part of it is stopping and slowing down and let God talk to your heart about the impact of your life between when you found Jesus and now. That's our witness. That's what we witness is what God's done for us. See, all of us are gifted uh, deeply and differently, vastly differently. Um, Linda could sure come up here and teach what's one of her gifts, but I couldn't stand up here and sing like she's singing, that's for sure. If I did, every song I sang would be pray for me. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, pray for you uh, is what it would be. It'd be half the church would be Lutheran by the next morning. <laughs> but um, a hero in the dictionary, think of a hero. We've got heroes in our life. It's kind of a cultural word, but we know what it means. A hero is a person noted for courageous acts. You've done some of those. No, or nobility of character. I think I see a room full of noble character. So I see a room full of heroes. You need to think of yourself the way God thinks of you. As Bill Johnson says, we can't afford to have a single thought in our mind about ourself that God doesn't have in his mind about us. Does that make sense? A hero is a person who, in the opinion of others, have special achievements, abilities, or personal qualities and maybe is regarded as a role model or an an ideal characteristic, someone that fights for a cause. I think this is a room full of heroes. Across Scripture, you think of examples like, remember Naaman, the Syrian general that had leprosy? And it talks about Naaman's wife had a maid, and she whispered, to Naaman's wife, you know, if he would go see Elisha, the man of God, I bet there'd be a real blessing there for him. Because of the maid of Naaman's wife and Naaman speaking to her husband and him being meek enough to hear and listen, that unsung hero, we don't even know her name except the maid, his wife's maid. It's like Peter's wife's mother or something that was healed or, you know. It's the, it's the little people the world calls us, right? Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and he said, not many mighty or noble are called. In so many ways, we're not so mighty, we're not so noble. But in God's eyes, we're kings and priests, we need to think of ourselves and speak of ourselves the way God did and does. Uh, there's lots of examples across Scripture. Jabez, you know about because of books written. You know about Mordecai. You know about Jethro. Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. When Moses was trying to you know, do his calling and uh, minister to his people, and it was his father-in-law that said, hey, I got an idea. If you'll share the wealth, <laughs> if you'll distribute the responsibility a bit, you, you won't die right in front of us here, you know. And so it's a beautiful little description about Jethro kind of pulling him to the side saying, you know, if you share the responsibilities, we'll get more done. See, and there's a lot of wisdom in, in leadership sharing responsibilities like that. Bezalel was the artisan at Exodus 35 that 
affected his, uh, the country when they were building the tabernacle. Bezalel, an artisan, you know, an artist working on the tabernacle is mentioned. He, you know, a small name in Scripture. The malefactor on the cross was a significant character in history. We don't know his name. I think of Lydia, the lady in Acts who, uh, you know, King James says she had a prayer group down by the riverside where prayer was wont to be made. In the old English, prayer was wont to be made. Everybody knew that Lydia had a prayer group down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. You know, Lydia, a seller of purple. She was a businesswoman. And she had a prayer group. In, in history, man, oh man, we're going to celebrate Lydia for her wonderful acts, you know, across Scripture. So these are champions. Yeah, it was said earlier, that uh, talked about names written in the book of life. Your name is written in the book of life. Your name. We talk a lot about the name of God. We talk a lot about, in fact, the word name in the Old Testament is substituted just for God himself sometimes. I called out to the name. What does that mean? I called out to God. <laughs> um, we talk about Jesus' name, but your name is written in the book of life. Your name, as Linda said, is, is tattooed on the palms of God, always before his face. Your name. Your name is significant. You should love your name. When I used to work with young people quite a bit, I would have them stand up on a chair and I would have them say two names, Jesus Christ, loudly, clearly, slowly, and their own name, loudly, clearly, slowly, because young people that I worked with for years seemed like the two names they had trouble saying clearly and slowly was Jesus Christ and their own name. You should be proud of your name, proud to hear your name, see, and proud of the name Jesus. There should never be the slightest inkling of a tinkling of a bad thought when you hear the only name, the only God gave his only son, Jesus. See, and he knows your name. I'd, I'd hate to be uh, in the future kingdom where Jesus would say to someone, I never knew you. Well, I don't think I want to be in those shoes. You know, people who feel like it was based on their religious accomplishments. But he knows your name. And your faithfulness magnifies your name. This map. Let's look at this map, Casey. The big one first. Christians, Jesus' followers have always been people of the book and people of the Spirit. One thing you should always confess about yourself is that I am a student of the Scriptures. If you want to be like Jesus, then be a student of the Scriptures. Jesus was a student of the Scriptures. He wasn't born with biblical knowledge. He learned it. He gleaned it. He read he said, have you not read? <laughs> Many times he would confront people and say, haven't you read that? See, we are people of the book and people of the Spirit. And I want to talk just briefly today. We're going to be, you can take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 4. That's the place we're mainly going to be today. And we're going to look at some of these unsung heroes. I love chapters like this where there's thanks expressed for that for the unsung heroes in Scripture. So, it, you know, you need a Bible, but you also need a Bible atlas or some maps or something just to generally get familiar. Uh, I think every Christian should care where Jerusalem is. I think you should care where Rome is. I think it should matter to you where Ephesus was. I think it should matter to you. And so when you're reading through Scripture and it says Paul went to Ephesus, why not pull out your Bible atlas and say, you know, that's where it is. We're, we're so concerned about so much information about so many things. But why not be just as interested in the Scripture as all your favorite hobbies that you study and read about and your favorite books? So... 
we're going to look at, see if this even works here, yeah. So down here is Jerusalem, see there? This is the Mediterranean, right? This is Europe up above here and Africa down below here and Asia up, this, this is Asia over here. Sarah would say, come on now, stay on your point. Uh, Jerusalem is down here, all right? Jesus didn't go far his whole life outside of this area right here. Um, we're going to look at a little town that's uh, called Colossae. And Paul went on three itineraries around here, around this area on this map, three itineraries, three trips. And the fourth trip was a trip to prison in Rome. And then he got out of that prison, apparently, that prison situation, and did a little bit of running around for a couple of years after the book of Acts. And you get a book like 1 Timothy and Titus. And then he was re-prisoned uh, uh, in Rome. And then we get something like 2 Timothy and then his martyrdom after that. So all of that happens. See, Rome is over here on the far left. See there? And there's the boot of what, what now is Italy. It wasn't Italy then. But, and Greece, this is all Greece right in here. It makes sense that Greece would be right near Turkey, right? That's, that's a joke, right? Greece and Turkey are near each other. And you can put it on red China, I guess. And if you're in a hurry, you're Russian. And when you're finished, you're Finnish. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyway, three people just left. That's all right. There's Ephesus. You've heard about Ephesus. This today around here is Turkey, Right? And the western part of Turkey we call Asia or Asia Minor. That's about the size of Ohio right there, if you're wondering, roughly, right in there. All, all Asia Minor heard the word of the Lord Jesus in two years and three months, it says in Acts, across about something about the size of Ohio in two years and three months without uh, Netflix and the Internet, right? And so you get Asia Minor all in there. Galatia, you've heard about Galatia. It's not a town. It's, a, it's an area. Galatia is kind of in the middle here of Turkey, Galatia. And so Paul many times went to these little towns, Antioch, Lystra, Iconium, Derby. He liked to run around in there. And that's Galatia in that area there. And the Ephesus is here. The Aegean Sea is here. Uh, up, up above here is called Macedonia, up in here. Down below here in Greece is Achaia or Achaia. And uh, Corinth is there. You hear a lot about Corinth and a lot about Athens in Acts 17. There's Thessalonica, uh, called today Thessaloniki. And uh, Philippi, you've heard of Philippi and the port city of Neapolis there. Troas, you've heard of, that's a port city. Uh, Miletus, they had a leaders meeting there. So you get a, a, a sense of this. There's Crete and all of those good things. Now, the next map, please, Casey. We're going to look specifically at, we're going to zoom in here on what today is Turkey. And what we show now is Colossae. See where Colossae is? Laodicea, Herapolis, Heriopolis, Philadelphia. You thought you knew where Philadelphia was. Now you know. <laughs> Uh, there's Ephesus. So you, you see kind of where you are now. There's Tarsus. Who was born in Tarsus? Paul. Paul. Well, that's a pretty smart group we got here. Paul of Tarsus. Wow, that's amazing. Somebody close with prayer. Uh, okay. So uh, it's kind of nice to, to see some of these places and get a, get a feel for the Scripture. So you see Colossae on there? That's the main thing. We're going to be talking about Colossae. We're talking about believers who... Uh, lived in Colossae. We don't know for sure that Paul ever went to Colossae, but we know believers who lived there. We know Philemon lived in Colossae. Onesimus was a slave of Philemon's in Colossae. And then Onesimus escaped and ran away. That's not a good thing when you have a commitment to somebody. Uh, but we, we read about him here. So we're going to talk about Colossae there. And Laodicea, you'll hear about. This is about 100 miles uh, east of Ephesus, Colossae. So let's look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 today. If you have your Bible with you or your phone or just watch it, Casey's going to go now from the maps to some of these scriptures. Paul, Paul was born 
you know, some people say around 5 A.D., and he got born again around 35 A.D., somewhere in there. So Paul, at this time, in what we're going to read here, this is a prison epistle, a prison letter. When Paul was in prison, sometimes called house arrest, at the, the end of Acts, okay, the end of Acts, 28 chapters in Acts. Acts 28 is about 35 or 40 years after Pentecost. Okay, and Paul is under house arrest at the end of the book of Acts. He's in his late 50s. He's in prison in Rome, and he's writing some letters, some prison letters, prison epistles. You've heard of those, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, a little short letter that takes about three minutes to read. Can you set aside three minutes? Ah, you got three minutes? Okay. Um, prison epistles. So, Colossians is one of the prison letters that he wrote from Rome on the map. Remember Rome? He wrote it back to Colossae. We don't have evidence that he had ever been there. But in the letter to Philemon, he said he wanted to go there. He said, you know, I'm praying that I'll be able to get there. Sometimes he even would use a phrase that we don't talk about much, if the Lord will. Sometimes we don't like, well, you, don't, you should never say that. You should make God do everything you want. Well, sometimes Paul would say, if the Lord will. Sometimes Paul would say, perhaps. In Philemon, sometimes Paul said, perhaps. In the written Word of God, Paul said, well, maybe this is what that means. Just relax a little bit, all right? These were living people. They actually walked and ate and had gas. You know, I don't know what they, what they did. Let me scratch that from the meeting notes. It's right here. In the... Okay. <laughs> so, we're going to read the, these uh, 12 uh, verses sometime around supper time. And uh, so, this is about 30, 35 years after Pentecost. Paul has got one chain on him and one soldier there. The bad, the bad people, they put at least two soldiers, the Praetorian uh, Praetorian, Praetorian guard back in Rome, but he had, it says, one chain and one soldier. And so they probably weren't too worried he was going to take his ink pens and run away, you know. Um, but this, this reading here, these 12 verses are a little bit like the group photo of Colossae and Rome, the believers there. Verse 7. I'm reading from the New International Version from 2011. There's several versions of the NIV. The 2011 version, the two postmen are mentioned first. We're going to look at just, well, a list of names. Because all we're really doing here is looking at a list of names. Because you are continuing in this list of names. They were trying to do then what you're trying to do now. They had a prayer life. They love to read scriptures, especially Old Testament and any pieces of other scripture that they had. They love to talk about things of God. They struggled with ideas. They had weaknesses. They had sin bugging them in their head that they tried not to think about. Uh, these are people that lived life like you 2,000 years ago. You're just a continuation of these great things. You're a part of the story that we're talking about this morning of the unsung heroes spiritually. Verse 7, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. We'll talk about each of these verses just briefly. Tychicus is one of the two guys that brought this letter from Rome in prison, Paul writing, uh, actually uh, having someone else write, but he was calling it out to someone. And uh, Tychicus was one of the two guys that brought this letter from prison over to Colossae, to this church. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me, Paul. He's a dear brother. He's a faithful minister. See, there's faith. The word faithful comes up a lot in these these sections. Uh, your homework assignment, one of them, is to read Romans 16. The last chapter in Romans is a lot like this. It was written uh, maybe five years before this, Romans 16, and it's got about 35 names in that one. Wouldn't that be fun to teach into the afternoon? 
So there's a bunch of names in Romans 16, like Phoebe was a great leader in the church. There were women, great women leaders in the first century church. Phoebe was one of those. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla in Romans 16, they had a church in their home. Aquila and Priscilla is a great study. We'll do that some Sunday morning where it shows they moved around to support the work of ministry, Aquila and Priscilla. Because I look around this room and I see Aquilas and Priscillas in this room. I see Phoebes in this room. I see Tychicus is. Tychicus will tell you all about the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant. That word servant is doulos. He was a slave, a bond slave. He was a fellow servant. Paul called himself a slave spiritually, a spiritual slave. And he was in prison at least a couple of times enslaved in prison. Verse 8 goes on to introduce you to the rest of how that letter got there. He says, uh, Paul says, I'm sending him, Tychicus, to you, you Colossian believers, for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may do what? Encourage, encourage your hearts. That word encourage is paraclesis, you know, to comfort. The comforter has come. The advocate, the calling to one side, to encourage Paul wanted to encourage these believers, many of whom he hadn't met, but he hoped to go visit them. Next, verse 9, he's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother. Tychicus was coming with Onesimus. Onesimus was the, was the escaped slave from Colossae. That's pretty bold for a believer who had a, been an escaped slave to come with Tychicus from Rome with Paul back to Colossae. I wonder if he was wondering if I'm going to run into Philemon here. He, here's a letter. Philemon, read this letter before you hit me. I don't know. Uh, from Paul, because you read the letter of Philemon, he says, don't beat up this guy. He's a brother in Christ now. And in Philemon, it describes that Onesimus, the escaped slave, became a faithful believer when he was uh, interacting with Paul in Rome in prison. Onesimus got born again when Paul was in prison in Rome. It's beautiful. Who is one of you? Onesimus, who is one of you? What does that sort of mean to you? What do you? Homeboy. Yeah, he was from Colossae. Yeah. He's one of you. He didn't even say, well, he was an escape slave and, you know. They will tell you everything that's happening here. Verse 10. Uh, it goes on with the list. I mean, Tychicus is a guy you hear actually quite a bit about. Um, I wanted to say something else about Onesimus, that Paul called him his child, his own child uh, in the faith. I thought that was pretty intimate, pretty special. Verse 10, my fellow pris a prisoner, uh, we don't know if this is a literal prisoner or a spiritual prisoner, because uh, <laughs> Paul describes sometimes how committed people were to God that they were a spiritual prisoner. To the world, freedom means no commitment. To God, you're more free the more committed you are to Him. That's why sometimes believers are called slaves to God. Because the more committed you are to God, the more free you are. That's one of the great paradoxes of Scripture that the world will never understand. Because the world doesn't want anybody telling them what to do. Anyway. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings. These are people who are sending greetings from Rome to where? Colossae. Uh, and so does who? Mark, these, are, these guys are sending their greetings from Rome back to Colossae. Mark is the cousin of whom? Barnabas. Barnabas. Mark is the, this is John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, John Mark. He wrote a certain gospel that you've got in your Bible. Uh, in Acts 13, on Paul's first itinerary, Mark got a little bit of a bad reputation because he kind of left the, the troop. He left the group that was was traveling with Paul and ruffled some feathers when he did it in Acts 13, 13. And then, Casey, can we turn to uh, Acts 15, 37? 
You might remember this, Acts 15, 37. Barnabas wanted to take John, that's John Mark, uh, well, also called Mark, okay, with them. Barnabas, uh, this is at the beginning of the second itinerary, the second loop of Paul's travels. And Barnabas and Paul are discussing what they wanted to do to make this trip. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. John Mark was related to who? Barnabas, right? He was the cousin, right? So Barnabas wanted to take his cousin, John Mark. Next, 38. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. That's pretty transparent, isn't it, Lenny? For them to expose, for him to put in writing, it's just Luke writing this, right? Luke is writing this and he's saying, He's exposing what happened. They had a fuss, we'd say in North Carolina. They had a fuss. Uh, because he had deserted them. That's a pretty strong word. He, he took off uh, back in the first itinerary. So Paul didn't want to take, Paul wanted him to be proven more before we take him on another trip. <laughs> okay, verse 39. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark, John Mark, and sailed for Cyprus, okay? And then Paul uh, chose Silas, and he left and commended the believers to the grace of the Lord. So Paul took Silas, they went on their second itinerary. So does it shock you when believers don't get along? Does it shock you when Christian leaders don't get along? Uh, that's not, it would be weird if they did always get along. That would, it would be a lie, first of all, and then it would be weird. So don't pretend and don't be discouraged when people don't get along, right? It's right. It's in the Bible. Okay. So Mark, this is John Mark, right? Uh, it's, it's good to know that Barnabas' name came up later in a positive light in, in 1 Corinthians. Paul talked again about Barnabas. So yeah, they had a disagreement, but they got happy later somehow. And Mark is talked about in a great light later. Paul didn't want to take him on this trip, but Mark is talked about in a beautiful light later. <clears throat> Mark is mentioned in Paul's last letter, right before he was martyred. He mentions John Mark. Isn't that great? And the Gospel of Mark was written around that time. The Gospel of Mark historically is tied a lot with Peter, also with Peter. And part of that's the connection between... Um, Peter and Mark and John Mark, uh, 1 Peter 5, 13, Peter calls him my son Mark. That's pretty intimate, my son John Mark. Uh, so, verse 11, let's go back to verse 11 from Colossians chapter 4. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. Jesus called Justice. Jesus, of course, a Hebrew uh, Aramaic name. That could have been Joshua there. Some translations may even have Joshua there, who is called Justice. Justice is a Latin name because a lot of the Hebrews also wanted to use a, a practical Latin name like Saul and Paul is talked about and other things. Uh, and sometimes they wanted their, their uh, Latin name to sound a bit like their Hebrew name that they chose. And so here you got Justice sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. These he's talking about are the last three, uh, Aristarchus, Mark, and uh, uh, Justice here. Those three are Jewish because he's in Turkey, remember? He's in the western part of Turkey. There's Gentiles there. Gentiles are non-Jews, right? And Paul makes a point here, and I find this culturally interesting. Paul makes a point here that he's got Jews and non-Jews on his team. You know, important leaders on his team. And he mentions that here. He makes a point to, to say that there. The Colossian believers were reading this. I like how it says they are co-workers for the kingdom of God. Co-workers for the kingdom. Look around the room. God calls these faces around the room co-workers for the kingdom. This Colossians chapter 4 is really about you. They just didn't have time to add your name. 
These people in this list, they had problems. They had questions that they've had their whole life and they've never understood the answer to. They had things that they had been praying about that they never quite figured out. They had physical maladies that they just never could get a handle on. They didn't like aging like you and me. It's weird, right? They had the same kinds of issues. These are disciples, Seth. These are disciples. It's like my grandson, uh, Ezra, prayed for the disciples the other day. He's three years old. What is? I mean, he's heard that name, word around his house, praying for the disciples. I don't know if he was praying for the 12 apostles or just all believers in general, but uh, Bapa and Grammy and the disciples. It sounds like a rock group. Um, I have to get Sakar on that. We'll put a song together, a little hit, hip-hop action there. I always thought it'd be fun if, if Tanya and Tom and I did a hip-hop song and have Sakar put it together. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I could, boy, that would be really interesting. Um, <laughs> then you wouldn't have to bother with all these, uh, these people in the ministry. Now, um, if they saw that, I don't know what they'd say. Proved a comfort to me. This was the, the three Jewish guys that were supporting him, but they were co workers for the kingdom of God. I think that's fantastic. Nobody knows anything about Jesus called justice. Not, nothing is more known about him, but his name happens to be mentioned here. See, some things you get recognized for, some things you don't. You think about Ananias. He's mentioned in, in Acts chapter 9, Ananias. He had a conversation with Jesus. He's called a certain disciple. I'm just a certain disciple. You're just a certain disciple. Paul was critical of some people that beat their chest in the first century church. They called themselves super apostles. He says, you know, don't be impressed by those super apostles. It was kind of an interesting way to, to, to do that. They're well, these super apostles. Um, but then he also talked about certain disciples. Ananias was a certain disciple. He had a conversation back and forth with Jesus about some guy named Saul that had just gone blind and got saved. And Jesus was preparing in Damascus, that northern sort of city north of uh, Bible lands, that, uh, you know, you're going to go to a street called Straight and you're going to minister to this guy. And Ananias said, oh! He's been killing Christians. I'm not going to talk to him. And Jesus had a little discussion, a little argument with him, whatever, convinced him. I, Jesus is probably pretty convincing if he's standing there, you know. I don't know how hard I'd be pushing back on any of his ideas. I, I would turn into a yes man real quick. A, a yes, whatever you're going to say. Yes, absolutely. You haven't said it yet, but yeah, amen to that, brother. We can even pray in Jesus' name. Well, here you are. Yeah. You know, Jesus had a little wristband, right? It said, what would Jesus do? Yeah, what would I do? Uh, what? <laughs> I messed that up, but it, it said, what would I do? Yeah, okay, anyway, thank you, Lord, for grace and mercy. What verse, what Bible are we in here? We're, we're back to 12, verse 12, a certain disciple, yeah. A certain disciple, certain disciple. We're in verse 12 on Epaphras. You know, we were at a memorial service yesterday, at, uh, Friday, Friday afternoon at a, a graveside service, a family-only kind of thing in Cincinnati for our dear friend Patty Vogt from Richmond. And uh, she was a certain disciple, but she touched hundreds of lives who are still touching other lives. And uh, Patty's husband, Rick, is here with us today. Uh, Rick, Rick was a dear friend. Rick and Patty were dear friends. Rick, can you stand up? Rick and Patty were dear friends to us. Before our kids got together, we met um, Amelia Vote Gigu is uh, Rick's and Patty's daughter. And many of you know uh, Amelia. And 
uh, Rick, and, Rick lives in Richmond, and Rick and Patty have been with us for years and years. Rick was one of the first uh, ministers' ordinations that John Schroyer recognized publicly in 1997 in Troy at the Motel 6. It had four <laughs> other names before that, owned by somebody named Patel, I'm sure. But um, on the stage, Rick's, John recognized Rick's uh, existing ordination, uh, and it may have been the very first one in the ministry. And Rick's been doing the work of the kingdom there in different churches in Richmond, and he's just written a book about the, the scriptures and how to, how to love it. And so it's been great uh, just here for a few days for Rick to come in. It's good to be here. And uh, so Thanks. a certain disciple, there's a lot of certain disciples, and you may be standing around at their memorial service. But give God the glory Amen. for the life that they lived, if it was short or long. We in the church see each other all the way through our lives. And Patty Vote and Rick Vote and you are in this list of Colossae. These are the same kinds of people doing the same kinds of things that you're trying to do. And it's an inspiration. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, so verse 12, we're about done here. Verse 12, uh, Epaphras, who is one of you, and a servant, a doulos of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. Epaphras, he, he is always wrestling in what? Prayer. Prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. Epaphras is one of you. So where is he from? Colossae. Because Paul is writing saying, it's another guy that's one of you guys. He's from that area at least. You with me? Yeah. yeah. Epaphras. He's mentioned several times in Scripture. And it says he was a doulos, a, a sold out bond slave of Christ Jesus. He sent greetings because he was there in Rome with Paul. Uh, and it's interesting, the hard work that's mentioned, because like if you read that Romans 16 account, it just keeps, we read it in St. Mary's, of it. it just keeps talking about the hard work, the hard work. These people worked hard, they worked hard. Uh, Dorcas Tabitha, she worked hard. She did uh, crafts and food and clothing. And when she died, they had her stuff laid out that she had made in the book of Acts. You know, the, the we honor God by taking the gifts that we have, the abilities that we have that are unique, and doing everything we can with them to glorify God and to move the kingdom, right? And that's what Epaphras was doing. He was praying. He was wrestling in prayer. This was the hard work that he was doing. We need, this is my point, we need to see Prayer as being some of the most important kingdom work that any Christian does. Stopping everything else and praying is not a waste of your time or God's. Why, Kevin, you don't need to say that. Well, yes, I do. If we prayed as much as talking about the importance of prayer, we'd change the world. Lord, we mean that and we quote verses about praying and Occasionally, we stumble into it, praying on our way to somewhere important, you know, and then we, we think that thinking is the same as praying. Why well, I, I pray all day. Well, or we're just thinking. Unbelievers think all day long, you know. Uh, you know, prayer is a conversation with the Father. He was always wrestling in prayer for the Colossian believers. Isn't that amazing? That word wrestling there is that, that word some of you may have heard of. It's, it's, it's a, uh, an athletic term. It meant it's agonizomai. It's to struggle. It's you're pressing, you're sweating, your body's... Uh, that's the way he prayed. There's times where you're struggling in prayer. There's times where we need to wrestle in prayer. It's not just I got big faith so prayer is easy. Jesus says he sweat, sweat blood praying, right? 
pray without ceasing. Well, there's sometimes where the hard work of being a Christian is very simply stopping every damn important thing you're doing and praying. Not because you have to, not because I got to be able to tell people I prayed for three hours today. Just because that's Christianity. This is Christianity. Praying a lot, reading the Bible a lot, being with believers a lot, talking about your faith a lot, and giving out of who you are. That's what Christianity is. And so if you're not doing some of those things, have you just made up your own faith? Have you made up? We don't get to make it up. This is what these people were doing. There's people that I, I'll bet that you're wrestling in prayer about, that they're on your mind. Mary Lou, you're often praying for one young man very close to you in your life and his health and his back, and that's called agonizomai. That's called wrestling in prayer is exactly what that is. We were just at the fellowship up at the Yeomans Thursday, and after I shared a few of these things, uh, Patty uh, Hall shared she had of course five wonderful testimonies and i was blessed to hear every one of them because it fit with every bit of this she she was an example of of everything that these people are doing and one of those is agonizing in prayer sometimes it's a push right the guys in the garden were trying to stay awake because of jesus at the end of his life and they couldn't stay awake it's there's a wrestling, there's a struggling. I think the Latins called it ora labora, the labor of prayer. Sometimes prayer is hard work, but we need to love God enough. Christianity is not about this organization or buying chairs. Uh, yeah, we're, we're doing events. We're doing all that. That's wonderful. But that sets the stage for all these great things that believers do. It's not the event that's the living. It's the the life that's built. We're not here to build an organization. We're here to build the life of Jesus in every person. Like Galatians, or yeah, Galatians 1 talks about that, I, that he would reveal his son in me. Paul prayed that God would reveal his son in Paul. That's our goal in life, that God would reveal his son in me. It's really pretty simple, isn't it? And that's what these people were doing. They were, and here they were struggling in prayer. Epaphras is the one that got the, that, that witnessed to the Colossian believers. In Colossians 1, 7, it says he's the one that taught them. He's the one that trained them. He, it wasn't Paul that planted the church in Colossae. It was Epaphras that planted the church in Colossae. Chapter 1, verse 7 says he trained them. You know, we're supposed to disciple the world, right? Jesus said, the last thing he said, the Great Commission was, Go disciple the nations. It wasn't just force them to call themselves a Christian. What in the world? We're not here for labels. He said the Great Commission was to, was to disciple. That means to, to build some roots, to build some depth, to disciple. Right? A disciple is a learner. Greek word means learner. A disciple is a learner. And Jesus told them, he said, look, I'm out of here. You guys take the power of the Holy Spirit that's coming and go disciple, turn the world into learners about him, about Jesus, where our lives focus on Jesus. I'm happy if your life is focused on God. But the way God set that up is for your life to be focused on Jesus. That's how you get to God. So just because your life is, talk, is focused on God, it's a little tangent. Just because your life is focused on God and you talk about God all the time, it's his idea that you're a Jesus follower. You understand that, right? Pharisees talked about God all the time. Verse 14. Our dear friend Luke is brought up in verse 14. Dear friend Luke, the what? the doctor, King James says physician, and Demas send greetings, our dear friend Luke. Can you imagine Luke traveling with Paul that knew medical stuff and Paul getting lashes, Paul getting stoned? It's not clear if he was literally dead or almost dead when they stood around him in Acts and they raised him from the dead. Paul had been stoned. I suspect that Luke's involvement at some of those times was really important. 
Luke used his natural gifts to move the kingdom. And you and I need to do that too. Whatever you might say, Kevin, I'm not good at nothing at all. <laughs> well, would you please just talk to somebody and figure out what that stuff is? Because <laughs> I think that about every other day. But go figure out what that stuff is and use whatever you're good at to move the kingdom. That's why I volunteer downtown about doing sketches for their facades downtown for eight years because I, that's therapy. That's the easiest thing in the world for me to do a sketch of a building. Don't put me in charge of singing or accounting downtown. I'll destroy the thing. See, But Luke was a physician, and so he, he used that. And he also wrote. Actually, if you count the Greek words, he wrote more than Paul in the New Testament, Luke. The, the 24 chapters of Luke and 28 chapters of Acts, that's a bunch of writing. And he was a doctor. When you get in the book of Acts and it says, we, he's, in one section he'll say, we did this and we did that. You know Luke is with him then. Because he said, we did it, not they did it. We did it. So look at the we sections and you'll find Luke in there. It's kind of cool. And Demas. Well, Demas sends greetings. This is a warning. Because Demas walked away from the faith soon after this. And yet, he's in Rome with Paul and Luke sending greetings to the Colossians. He's even listed in Philemon as a, one of the believers that sends love. In 2 Timothy 4.10, right before Paul was martyred, Paul wrote, Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. That should be a warning to us. See, the Scripture is so honest about that. See there? Demas, because he's loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Christians gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. That's where all the dogs were. Verse 15. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. My, 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 my. Hmm, that's kind of cool, isn't it? The church in her house. I see a, a bunch of nymphas in here. People that bring people to their house, people that pray for people in their home, people that say, can I have a cup of coffee with you? Can I have a sandwich? You need a place to stay. Given the hospitality, that was nympha. And she even had a church in her house, an ecclesia in her house. See, in the Bible, the word church, the word ecclesia, was never a building. The Bible, it was never a building. For two or three hundred years, the church was never a building. They never said, I'm going to church. They didn't picture bricks. The church is you, and that's, that's who these people are that we're reading about. Nympha had a church in her house. Your home is a sanctuary, a holy place. You may not have meetings there. You might, but you might not. But your, your home is a sanctuary. It's a holy place. Nympha, she was a leader. That woman was a leader in the church. And she dedicated her home and everything she owned to the move of the kingdom. Verse 16, after this letter, after this letter has been read to you, see, tell me if there's a word in here you see brought up a couple of times. After this letter has been read to you, see that it's also read in the church of the Laodiceans down the street, and that you turn you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. What, what's in there a bunch? Reading. reading. Well, I thought if we just had Holy Spirit, why do we need to read all that? That's, that's a physical thing. You got to think. <laughs> you got to stop. You got to sit down. You got to buy a book. That's a reading business. Paul said, when you read, you will understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, Ephesians 3. When you read, you understand. Jesus said, have you not read? If you're going to be a person of the power of the Holy Spirit, you need to be a reader and find out what the Holy Spirit gave. These words are spirit and they are life. See, it's beautiful. That's why in Timothy, Timothy said, look at 1 Timothy 4.13 quickly, please. 1 Timothy 4.13, NIV, until I come, Paul said, until I come, devote yourself to what? 
the public reading of Scripture to preaching and to teaching. Devote yourself to teaching. Well, I should ask myself, have I devoted myself to the public reading of Scripture? I should ask myself, have I devoted myself to preaching? I should ask myself, have I devoted myself to teaching? This is, this is the Word of the Lord. Paul said he got it from Jesus. This is Jesus talking. Public reading of Scripture. A lot of the first century believers couldn't read. Illiteracy was rampant in the first century. It's difficult. So a lot of times the public reading was where it was at. Verse 17 back in Colossians. Tell Archippus, is a one last name is mentioned there. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. See to it you complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. That's my prayer for you. See to it that you complete the ministry that you received in the Lord. See to it that you complete the ministry. Because we don't even know what ministry he's talking about. We don't know what work. We don't know what assignment Archippus was on. We don't know the mission. You can read the rest of the Bible. It doesn't tell you. There's a lot of things that the Bible does not tell you and you can't know unless God would tell you. Right? And here's one. Complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. Complete the ministry. There's our prayer. Complete the ministry. We're co-workers for the kingdom. We read that phrase. Co-workers for the kingdom. Complete the ministry that God set in the life of every person sitting in this room, every person on the hookup. That's our prayer is that you would complete the ministries. Ministry is just the word service. Complete the service as a sung hero or unsung hero. Not many mighty or noble are called, but you are called. The folks in the living rooms that are listening in, God bless you for your work. God bless you for your faithfulness. Congratulations for your faithfulness to the kingdom. We pray that you would complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. And what's the final verse there in the the whole letter to the Colossians, verse 18? He, He wrapped it up and signed it. He said, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. A lot of times they would... They would dictate it, the guy would write it down, and then they would sign their name at the end. Tanya does that to her letters sometimes. Signs her name just to send a little blessed note on the end. And Paul says, remember my chains, grace be with you. Isn't that amazing? He said, remember my chains. That's not negative. That wasn't negative to Paul that he was working on something. He had some circumstances. Circumstances. Remember my chains. I'm in prison. He said, keep me in your prayers, right? I would ask you to stand, please. Father, I thank you for your people today, that they are the continuation of Colossians chapter 4, that they are a continuation of Romans 16, that they are Acts 29, another chapter in the history of the Christian church, Father, that just thank you for the people that we read about, Father. Thank you for the Epaphrases, and thank you even for the Demases, and thank you for the Aquilas and the Priscillas and the Phoebes. Thank you, Father, for the lives of those people that have done what they did that brought Christianity to the world. There's over two billion Christians in the world today, and a lot of that has to do with the people we read about today. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that we are a part of what was started then. We're just as much a part of that same church, that same scripture, that same Holy Spirit power, Father. I minister to your people today that you would heal bodies today, that cares would be cast today, that burdens would be lifted today, that you would show us how to keep the truth simple today, Father. Keep the truth simple Father, I pray right now for our time in the Scriptures this week ahead, if the Lord tarries. Father, the time that the believers listening will have where they sit down and they turn everything else off and they read the Word with great joy. And you speak to them as your written voice ministers to their hearts and lives and directs them. Thank you for the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts this week through those Scriptures and directly to us Father, bless our week in the Lord. Bless our week in the Lord. Father, complete the ministries that are in this room. Complete the ministries in this room. Complete the ministries as co-workers of the kingdom. Co-workers of the kingdom. 
Thank you, Father, for blessing your people, for great joy, and your son's return soon. In Jesus' powerful name, amen, amen. amen. God bless you. I love you. Great. All right, Kevin, so we read, pray, and make a difference. So.